All right, so today we're going to continue our exploration of sinusoids, what they look like. We will be graphing sinusoids given an equation and coming up with an equation for a sinusoid given a graph. And before we start, let's look at our two basic sinusoid equations. So here is the first sinusoid is called sine of theta. And as we've done, as you've seen the other day, is it starts up, it starts at the sinusoidal axis, goes up to 1, down to negative 1, and it ends at 3, 6. It doesn't actually end. It continues to, to go. Here's 180. This would be negative 180, et cetera. And that's our sine graph. Now, our cosine graph is exactly the same shape. In fact, I could take that graph and copy it, and it would be my, um, let's clone this. And this is my cosine graph. The only thing that's different is it starts with the high spot on the y-axis, and it goes from there. So they are exactly the same graph, just with a phase displacement, which is one of those words you're going to have to know for this test. But it similarly goes up to 1, down to negative 1. It also has a period of 360. And if you don't know what those words are, then we're going to go into that a little more detail in a bit. Um, so these sinusoids, one important feature of sinusoids is that they are all curving. When you go to draw them, and you will be expected to draw them, I want nice curvy shapes. Um, one part that they have, so when we talk about a graph, and it's not just sinusoids, any graph where the curve faces down is what we call concave down. So these are the parts of that graph on your paper which are concave down. You might want to label them. And then any time that it's, the curve faces up, it's what we call concave up, right? And as you draw your graph, you should be paying some attention to where your curve changes and those spots where we change from concave down to concave up or concave up to concave down also have a name, and they are known as inflection points, points of inflection. When you get to Calc 1, this will become a very important feature of graphs, and not just sinusoids, but all graphs. So you want to know those are our points of inflection. Some of the other key terms we want to talk about with sinusoids is every sinusoid has a max, and otherwise known as a high point or an upper bound, and a min. Okay? Those are important. These lines on this graph are not asymptotes. We actually go through that high point and go through that low point. Um, they are just sort of little guidelines to help you when you're drawing. Sometimes it helps to draw your upper bound and your lower bound as you're trying to draw your graph. Another key feature is what we call the sinusoidal axis. And the sinusoidal axis is a horizontal line through our graph, through the inflection points. It is the vertical middle of our graph. And as you should have discovered yesterday, the distance from the sinusoidal axis to the top is what we call the amplitude, also known as the distance from the sinusoidal axis to the low point. That's what we call our amplitude. Okay. Um, so your basic equation for a sinusoid could be c plus a cosine b theta minus d. That pretty much covers all our transformations with the possible exception of a vertical flip or a horizontal flip. Um, and remember, every, co every sinusoid, you can write a cosine equation or a sine equation to represent. They would have most parts the same. The only difference is going to be our phase displacement. So if we look at these letters and what they're doing, um, the A right here is, if you imagine starting with the original function of cosine of theta, A is an outside transformation that is a vertical stretch. Right? So if I think about my original graph, that's cosine theta. Imagine it continues. 2 cosine theta is going to do a vertical stretch factor of 2. Instead of starting up at 1, we're going to start up at 2, and we're going to go down to negative 2, and so on, like so. Okay. Oops, that should be directly over, like that. Right? So our A is the vertical stretch, and it changes our amplitude. Um, I'm going to skip over the B for a minute and come back to that because that is the trickiest part of all our transformations. C is the location of the sinusoidal axis. It is also an outside transformation, and so it is our vertical shift up or down. And when we shift 
everything moves, your high point moves, your low point moves, but it's easiest to track your sinusoidal axis because that is not affected at all by your stretch. So your C is your, is your vertical shift. Um, D is an inside transformation, and it is adding and subtracting. So that is our horizontal shift, and we call that in trig terms our phase displacement. So you want to know that the phase displacement means the horizontal shift. And again, when we are talking about cosine of theta versus sine of theta, so for sine of theta, right, if I want to know my phase displacement, it's going to be, that is going to be my phase displacement. Because normally, this part starts on the y-axis at 0, 0. And so that's the point we want to follow for our phase displacement. Now for cosine, we start at the very top here. And so my phase displacement comes from where that point ends up. All right. And now we're getting to the last tricky part, which is B. It's the reciprocal of the horizontal dilation. It's our horizontal shrink or stretch. And if I multiply by 2 inside, that means I shrink horizontally one half. And if I multiply by one half or 0.5 inside or divide by two inside, that's going to stretch my graph. And so that B changes the period, but it is not the period. So when we get come to filling these in, if you write down this number, this B number, whatever this is, as your period, you will be wrong. A is your amplitude. C is your vertical shift. It, it is where your sinusoidal axis is. D is where your um, phase displacement. But B just influences your period. You have to actually find the period. And to find your period, you are going to take your normal graph, your normal period, which is 360, and then do the transformation. So if I have cosine of 2 theta, that's going to be a horizontal shrink, and I take my normal period of 360 and divide by 2, and that is my new period. Okay, So in general, to find your period, right, the period is always going to be 360 divided by B. And then when we're going the other direction, when you know your period and you're trying to come up with the equation, um, by virtue of reciprocals here, B turns out to be 360 over your period. So if, if I'm dividing by 2, that's going to give me a period of 180. Well, if I divide 360 by 180, the new period, I would get a B of 2. And so that's one way you can do it. You can also think about it's a horizontal transformation. So what's happening? Um, one more word we're going to talk about really quickly that's related to period is called the frequency. So your period is basically, the, the period is how many units. And for now, we're measuring in degrees, but it could be any unit. How many units in one cycle? Your frequency is how many cycles in one period, or in one unit, let's say that. How many cycles in one unit, so in one degree. And you get your frequency by doing 1 over the period. So if you think about our graph that had a period of, say, 360, okay? So 360 degrees makes one cycle. How many cycles are there in one degree? Well, there's one 360th of a cycle in one degree. So that's how you find your frequency. All right, let's just look at a few problems. You're going to um, flip over your worksheet to Exploration 3.2a, and we're going to work through this together. So not really as an exploration, although you certainly may pause the video before I even start and see if you can fill this in. So here's our equation. Um, horizontal dilation factor, we're going to 
we're going to shrink by 2. So if you think about that, my period is normally 360. If I shrink by 2, my new period is 180 degrees. And you can think about it in your head, or you can say, oh, Ms. Kirstead told me 360 over B is my period. So let's do 360 over 2, and I get 180. I don't know which is going to work better for you, but whichever one works, that's fine. Our amplitude comes from stretching it vertically. So that's going to be our 3. And if there's a negative here, we're going to disregard that as far as our amplitude goes. Um, so we said the amplitude is the, is the positive. What a negative does is it actually vertically flips our graph. All right, next, our phase displacement. That's the the horizontal shift. And so that comes in here. And so this graph right here is going to go 70. And the subtracting 70 means I'm actually going to the right because all my horizontal transformations are backwards. And then the last piece is our vertical displacement. And this is otherwise known as the location of our sinusoidal axis. And that's the vertical shift. And that's at 4. All right. So now we're going to try and graph this. So we're going to walk through it. So I said that um, my sinusoidal axis is at 4. And that's always a good place to start. So I'm just going to draw this. Remember, this is not an asymptote. This is kind of a little helpful thing. And before we go any farther, I want to talk about, now I want to find my upper bound and my lower bound. These are going to be helpful things. So from the sinusoidal axis, I go up and down my amplitude. So from 4, I'm going to go up 3 to get to the very top. So I'm going to kind of draw that in. And I'm going to go down 3 to get to the very bottom. Remember, again, not asymptotes. These are little things I'm drawing to help me graph this correctly. Right? So I have that in there. So I know that my graph will totally be between my green lines and that the, it changes concavity at the blue. So I need a couple more pieces. This is a cosine graph. So cosine graphs for my phase displacement, I am going to follow the very top spot because that is what is normally, right? That's not where, it, that's not the vertical part. But normally cosine starts with the high spot on the y-axis. So that is going to be to the right 70. And then I also want to think about my period before I kind of draw in an x scale. And I actually often like to draw my graph and then add my scale later on. Um, so I want to shift right 70, and my period is going to be 180. So let's make 70 something like this. That's where the top of my graph will be. Now we're going to want four key features for each cycle. I want to know where it starts, so then this would end 180 degrees later. So if I take 180 plus 70, I'm going to hit the high spot again at 250. Okay. I also want to know where am I going to hit the low spot. Well, that's in the middle. So if I think about 180 and half of that, so 90 above 70 or 90 below 250 is where I'll hit the low spot. So that's going to be at 160. And then I have to cut that in half again. So if I cut 90 in half, I'm going to get 45. So if I go 45 up from 70, that's going to be 115, right? And so this is 45. This should be another 45. I need another 45, which would take me to, I believe, 205. That's where I'm going to hit the middle again. And then another 45. Now I have enough key features that I can kind of draw a graph. And I can continue going backwards. So back from 70, if I go back 45, I believe I'm at 25. I'll be at the middle. If I go back another 45, um, I'll be at negative 20. I'll hit the very bottom. right? And now I'm going to try and draw it. And so from the bottom to the middle, we are concave up. From the middle. Back to the middle again, we are concave down. And now I'm concave up to the middle again, concave down. And so I will want to see on your graphs at least these four, one, two, three, four, actually five key spots so that I know you understand how we've broken our graph down. Okay? Let's try one more. All right, so horizontal dilation factor is 30. 
What does that mean for my period? I shrink 360, I divide it by 30, and I get 12. My amplitude is the vertical stretch, that's 4. My phase displacement is left 1, that plus 1, remember we'll be back, backwards. And my vertical displacement, or um, I like to say sinusoidal axis, is going to be at negative 2. So let's put that all together and try and draw a graph. Sinusoidal axis of negative 2 right there. And then from there I go up and down 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. There's going to be the top. And then I go down 4. 4. So my graph vertically will be between there. My phase shift is back 1. And remember, my period is 12. So, so I don't have to have, I can have a fairly decent scale. So if this is negative 1, and this is a sine graph. So for sine graphs, my phase displacement comes from that point on the sinusoidal axis, and that is shifted back 1 to right here. Now my period, we said, was 12. So I will hit the sinusoidal axis again and repeat my motion 12 later. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12. Boom, there we are. Now if my period is 12, I want to think about, basically your, your graph is split into four parts. There's one up here, this is two down, three to the bottom, four up. So if the whole length is 12, each of those little quarters of my graph is going to be three units. So from negative 1, I'm going to hit the top 3 later, right here at 2. My scale is a little iffy. 3 later, 1, 2, 3, I'm going to be back on the sinusoidal axis. 3 later, yeah, I got really close together. I'm going to be at the bottom. And remember, I'm concave up and concave up. And I would continue in that manner, 3 over to hit the top, 3 over to come back. 3 over to hit there, because my period split into four equal parts means each sort of quarter of my sign of one cycle goes over 3. And there you have it. And now you can try it on your own, and we'll see you tomorrow.